Okay, good morning. Welcome to Quality Leaders. We're very happy to have you here. Um, we are pleased to kick off our session with a very important topic that has a lot of relevance to the work that we do and the people in our communities that we serve. Uh, this morning, we are going to be starting our session with exploring uh, how we can best support the behavioral expression of our residents, especially given some of the changes that we've seen in the regulations, the state operations manual, um, as well as what we're seeing in audits that are happening. So hopefully this is valuable and uh, relevant to the work that you're doing. We are recording the session and the session is available on our YouTube channel. So happy to uh, have that available to anyone that is not able to join us live and encourage any of us to share that information with anybody that we may find a uh, team that would find it valuable and meaningful. Next slide, Olivia. We are uh, serving a very complex and changing population of individuals um, as we are meeting their needs and understanding how we can best advocate for their highest quality of outcomes. We're looking to understand uh, what their behavioral expression needs are and how we can best support that. So this hour, we're gonna talk about the behavioral support strategies that we can employ in nursing homes with that quality improvement focus around uh, how we can maintain that continued compliance and continued outcomes. Next slide. As we're doing our session, we have individuals monitoring the chat. And so feel free to uh, ask any questions, raise your hand if you'd like to join in. Uh, hopefully this is an uh, engaging opportunity, but we recognize that sometimes um, it takes a little bit to feel comfortable asking some questions. So even if you send a very, uh, uh, directed message to one of us as the presenters. We're happy to answer that and uh, work that into our conversation. Uh, to ask a question or to speak up, you feel free to unmute, uh, raise your hand, or type in the chat box. You can adjust the audio settings on your computer by adjusting your microphone and speaker settings as well. Um, all Everyone's been muted just to help us to, to keep the presentation moving forward. However, um, we're happy to unmute and involve you in those conversations. Next slide. Uh, I am pleased to introduce our team of presenters today. Uh, I am Alyssa Pischel, uh, the Director of Post-Acute Quality Improvement and the State Director for the QIO work here in South Carolina, and an absolute pleasure to be with you. I'm a nursing home administrator by background and profession and a cheerleader for all the amazing work that we do in the industry. Stephanie Brown, would you like to give an introduction to yourself? Hey, I'm Stephanie Brown. I have been a nurse for all about 42 years now. I've done everything from acute care, long-term care, survey, uh, North Carolina surveyor, and uh, I am also thrilled to be here. Uh, this is my first webinar. I've always taught classes face-to-face, -face, so this is a little bit different for me, but I'm very excited. And I'm glad we're getting this back off the ground, and, and I'm looking forward to lots of uh, great webinars to come. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, also joining us today is Catherine Plunkett. Catherine, would you like to talk to uh, introduce yourself? Hi, good morning. I'm looking forward to getting to know this group more over the next couple months. Um, I'm a social worker by trade and have a background in quality improvement. Um, and so I look forward to, to working with everyone as we work to improve the health of our nursing home residents. Nice. Thank you, Catherine. Also running our presentation and keeping all of us on track is <laughs> Olivia Smith. And that's for sure. Hello everyone, my name is Olivia. I'm a project management professional and a certified scrum master and I'm here to support everyone along with this presentation, so welcome. Thank you, Olivia. And of course, I think everybody knows Chris Williamson. Uh, Chris is our lead for nursing home work in South Carolina uh, and is a, a incredibly valuable member to our team. Good morning, it's nice to see you all again, and I hope that you will be very happy to see the relaunch of our Quality Leaders Program and find it very helpful to you. Let's turn it over to, uh, to our leaders. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Thanks. next slide. 
So over the next um, session here, we'll talk about um, an overview of what the programming looks like in our facilities. We're gonna look at some publicly reported data to get some insights as to uh, where we may be seeing uh, some of the actions that we have coming from the SOM um, and also as well as the, the federal audits that are coming down the line. Uh, we'll go over medications and side effects and antipsychotic use, as well as really understanding and exploring how we can use quality assurance in an ongoing manner to maintain that compliance and that sustained compliance for improved outcomes. Of course, we want to encourage this ongoing discussion, uh, but we'll wrap up with any other questions that you may have, and we'll talk about what our next uh, meeting is. So kicking this off, next slide. Let's go. Behavioral expressions. I put this slide in here. This is one of my favorite um, level sets when I think about how our industry has evolved. And so um, for those of you that may remember watching Golden Girls, I think it's still on TV on uh, Nick at Night. I think it plays um, on the evening times. The Golden Girls uh, was a show of four ladies living in Florida. Um, the lady in the red outfit, Sophia, uh, kicked off the first session. Um, she moved in with her daughter into Blanche's house, lady in the green shirt. Um, and Sophia moved in because she was kicked out of Shady Pines Nursing Home. She <laughs> caused a fire in the nursing home. Um, several scenes and episodes later into Golden Girls, um, Sophia had taken a car and was driving driving around South Miami um, <laughs> with Blanche's car, causing all kinds of havoc and so forth. And so when you stop and think about it, in the 80s, what, was what were nursing homes? So if Sophia was in a nursing home and that she was receiving that level of care in that convalescent setting, what type of setting does that look like now? Um, today, we would see Sophia, um, not only did she successfully live with these four ladies in Florida, but she may live in a senior living apartment. She may live in a CCRC. She may transition to assisted living level of care. Her level of care is extraordinarily high. It's not what we're seeing in the industry today. It's not what we're um, serving in our communities today. As the options have evolved over the last several decades on what community living looks like and community support. We've seen that the change and we've seen that change reflected in the population that we have in our facilities. Next slide. So there's a lot of research that's been done on this and it's pretty shocking information, but on the same aspect as an administrator, I found a little bit of comfort in it going, so it's not just me. <laughs> We're seeing this in other places. Nationally, 16.5% of nursing home residents are under the age of 65. So we're seeing a younger population coming into our facilities. Generally, that population is coming in in a multitude of, of service needs. Sometimes they're coming in with, um, as a result of long-term accidents, long-term debilitating illnesses. Sometimes they're coming in for short-term rehab services and converting to long-term uh, care due to lack of community options. But regardless of that, we have a population uh, change in our facilities we have to be mindful of. The, the services and support we provide to people that are in their 80s may be slightly different for people that live in their 40s. Mm -hmm. um, since 1985, residents with serious mental illnesses, which includes substance use disorder, has risen from 11% in 1985 to 31% in 2015. And that's in nursing homes. So a high number number of SMI is being noted into our facilities. We recognize that individuals with SMI have a potential to convert to long-term care due to um, lack of community resources. And in a post-pandemic environment, we're seeing that lack of community resources really becoming a stronger issue. Uh, behavioral expression needs of residents with SMI strongly differ from those with dementia. Um, sometimes they they have similar impacts on the outcome that we have. It can cause stress on themselves. It can cause stress on the people that are living in their community with them. So there is that multifaceted impact, but the root cause of what may be driving these can be significantly different and how we support that then needs to be different. We note that um, residents with SMI are noted to receive less mental health care in the nursing home environment than individuals with dementia. Um, in the early 2000s, we saw a significant push around how we can support dementia. And I think that um, maybe it's just me personally speaking this, but I think that we're really leading the 
the edge of this across the globe on how we're advocating for how do we support individuals with dementia and dementia care. As our environments are changing, I, we're now starting to look at SMI in that same lens of how do we understand, support, and provide care and services for that population. Um, many organizations don't have access to behavioral health services. They have been complicated in this post-pandemic environment. We're seeing staffing challenges across multitudes of industry and may not have those supports available. We're also seeing the inability to connect in community resources due to staff um, staffing in those areas. And so that can have an impact on how we provide that holistic approach to our, our facilities and our staff. I'm sorry, our residents. Next slide. One third of our nursing home residents reported in 2018 have a behavioral health diagnosis. Um, so we've talked 31% of individuals as SMI. We're seeing that a third of the individuals in the nursing home settings have behavioral diagnosis. And we see, in, as reported in 2019, 65 to 90% of individuals residing in nursing homes are experiencing a behavioral health concern. That can be anxiety, it can be depression, it can be loneliness. There's multi multitude of of um, uh, expression needs that are linked into what a behavioral health concern is. Um, and, and fear, anger. Um, so we consider all of these different expressions. Um, I thought it was really interesting that there's um, research that shows that while we're addressing dementia behaviors, while we're addressing um, depression, anxiety has been creeping up as an area of concern in a nursing home setting that we may not have been putting attention to and, and supporting as well. This is another potential increase of risk of behavioral expressions that may be affecting themselves or others in their environment. Uh, I think of the individual that um, cries out uh, in in their room or in the hallway, crying out for help, crying out for fear, crying out because they're nervous and what that can do for people residing around them. Um, if somebody's saying, that's enough, that's enough, Mildred, you need to stop saying that. That doesn't feel good for that person that's crying out. You have other people now um, that are not supportive, but while there may be residents, may not be supportive of that, that emotional expression. So things that are leading into considerations we need to have. Next slide. So the root cause is really is important in this. And when we go back to the root cause, it's ask, asking the question, why? Um, there's the famous phrase, ask the question why six times to get to the root cause of it. And so we look at what the visible problem is <clears throat> and then ask why to get to the first level cause, but then start digging a little bit deeper to get what to, to what the root of the, the situation is. Why are you calling out? What is happening? Um, lots of different experiences over my career where we've been able to dig into root causes. One of my um, one of my favorite examples of a team that worked really hard at understanding what the behavioral expression needs of a resident was relating to anxiety and her inability to sleep at night. She had been telling the staff that she saw little people running up and down the hallway at night and it scared her. And so um, we looked at multiple things that may be causing it. We checked the physical condition. We checked, um, had her sent to the uh, eye doctor, checked her eyesight, eyesight was good had pharmacy come in and take a look and see what medications may be causing this. Um, finally, the social worker um, in one evening, six o'clock in the evening, it was winter time, so it was darker. Um, six o'clock in the evening, she was sitting on the resident's bed talking to the resident and the resident was getting anxious and fearful and said, it's about to start. And she goes, there they are, can you see them? And what the social worker identified was the resident, because it was dark outside, and the hallways were lit up, when staff were walking down the hallway, their image was projecting in the window like a mirror. And so the resident was seeing the little people in the window saying that that's who was running around the facility at night. And so by recognizing that it was the window picking up the mirror image of the hallway, we ensure that the blinds were closed. It was a rural setting, so the, the blinds were open for some people to see the deer outside and the turkeys and the woods. Um, so we ensured that we care planned, keep that blind closed at night when it got dark out. Um, it resolved her concerns. She 
eliminated that anxiety. We did not have to go down the road for psychotropics and we're able to create a really good environment for this resident. But it took work. It took work to get to that root cause. And I think that that's where our opportunity is, is when we're thinking about behavioral expressions, we want to ensure that we're doing those root causes and we're taking those steps to understand what may be linking to it before we go down the route. It could have been, um, she might have been hallucinating, but in this case, we were able to figure out what that was. So not always easy, and it took a lot of time, but an example of where we can look to see how, what that root cause is and what is driving to the behavioral expression affecting others. Next slide. I'm gonna hand it over to Catherine to talk about publicly reported data. Great, um, next slide. Um, just a brief review of what the data is available on Medicare Care Compare. These are under quality measures and reported by all nursing homes, as everyone knows. And so I just, it's, it's, it's good to see like a benchmark of where we're performing in the region. And then of course, when you're looking at your own facilities measures, you can kind of benchmark against these measure, uh, against these numbers to sort of see where you're performing and where there might be opportunities for improvement. Next slide. And so these are really process quality measures. They speak to, um, you know, the success maybe of, of um, behavior interventions. They are definitely not the end all be all of a measuring of success of, of managing behavior expressions, but they can help you understand, you know, where you're performing and if, if there's opportunities for improvement. So um, this is the national average, all these graphs, the first bar is the national average for these measures, and then the rest are for the Southeast region. South Carolina performs pretty much on par with the national average on all these, on all these measures we're going to review is a good place to be. Um, and all these measures, the lower is better for the quality measure for this process measure. Um, so the first one is antipsychotic medication use in 2023. Lower is better. And we know antipsychotic meds can be used for certain mental health conditions, uh, but not for all. And so you can see we're performing about on average as far as in the Southeast and in the nation. And then when this slide deck is shared later after this webinar, you can kind of look up where your facility lands and compare it to where you where um, you are both in the Southeast and the nation and in South Carolina, just to give you your idea. And it's something you can also bring back to your quality improvement team meetings just to help your team better understand of, of where, where on average you're performing. Um, it's hard to look at a number and not know what to compare it to if it's good or bad. Next slide. The next is long stay residents who have symptoms of depression in 2023, and this is measured through the PHQ-9, lower is better. South Carolina actually performs really well. Um, we were debating this as a team last night, is it because it's sunnier here compared to other regions of the country? The weather is nicer. It's not like winter nine months out of the year. Um, we don't know, but we're, our residents on average across the state of South Carolina perform much better compared to the national average, which is more about 9% of patients, of uh, residents who have long, uh, who have symptoms of depressions, and we're performing more at like 3.8, I think was the exact number. So that's pretty good. Don't know what's happening in Tennessee, um, but uh, South Carolina, we're performing well in this measure overall. Next slide. And then here you can look at the, the number of long-stay residents who got anti-anxiety or hypnotic medication last year. Lower is better. Um, and we know these can be used for some mental health conditions, definitely not all. And you can see in South Carolina, we're performing about on average with the national, with the national average, which is good. Again, don't know what's happening in Tennessee, but um, you can kind of see where we are <laughs> compared to others. Next slide. And lastly, it's the percentage of residents, long stay residents who were physically restrained in 2023. Um, lower is, of course, better. And you're when you look at, you know, the percentages, you're looking at all under 1%, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So South Carolina is slightly above the national average. I think it was like 1.8% or, or 0.18%, excuse me. And then the national average was slightly below um, 0.1%. Um, so very, very low numbers here. Almost, you know, it could, with that low, it could easily be skewed a little bit, um, but it's still, you know, we're tracking on average and 
again, it's just something good to take this back on your in your quality team discussions to kind of help understand where your facility lands with these measures as related to other benchmarkable um, statistics at the national and state levels. Next slide. Okay, we're handing it over to Stephanie to talk about psychotropic medication use and programming. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm, again, very excited to be here. Please, um, at any point that you have a thought, you know, a, a something you want to share, just whatever it is, an emoji. I love emojis. Uh, Lisa can tell you that. Uh, anything that you thought or maybe you've had an experience that we can all learn from as well. That's the best way. And if you put anything in the chat and that you and you don't want to be called out, don't worry. I will not call out your name unless you want me to. But you know, please ask questions and please share anything that you can add to this presentation. That would be that would be phenomenal. So okay, so I am going to focus a little bit more on the uh, medications and uh, some of the side effects. So the first medication that I would like for us to just for a glance that. And I'm not sure if I have nurses out there or if I have administrators. So, um, again, I'm not sure. So I, I don't mean to insult anybody. I, I want to just make sure we all understand the same basic things. Um, so I want to start with the psychotropic medications. And this, uh, this group of medications it includes any drug that affects behavior, mood, thoughts, perceptions, um, and they are most often treated uh, are used for treating of mental health disorders. The thing about these medications, and, and you know, there's all kinds of side effects, there's all kinds of things going on, um, but, and we're gonna get to one of the biggest side effects in a few minutes, um, but it's usually typically because of a dopamine or a serotonin problem in the brain. It usually it's too much of it. Um, and you know, dopamine, serotonin, they are neurotransmitters and they, or they get on these with these proteins and they allow communication from our brain cells to all parts of our body, including our movements. So that just to give you a little background, but the, you know, there's all kinds of theories, but the, the great majority of the theories of why we have issues with especially involuntary movements or other things is a dopamine or a serotonin problem, mainly dopamine. So there are five, um, five different types of antidepressant, or sorry, uh, of psychotropic, sorry. Um, there's antidepressants. Uh, we have anti-anxieties. Um, we have stimulants, uh, antipsychotics, and then we have our mood stabilizers. Stabilizers, excuse me. Um, does anybody have any questions yet about any of that? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, with the... With the antidepressants and anxieties, you know, the commons are, common ones are the SSRIs, which are the serotonin selective reuptake. Um, then we also have the SNRI, the serotonin norepinephrine uptake. Ooh, Lord, these are me to say. Um, and they work in different ways. Uh, this, the SSRI works more with the uh, basically the mood regulation that somebody might need or the SNRI is a little more effective with maybe the more of the, the panic, the worry, um, because it adds some norepinephrine in there. And, um, but you know, again, that's that's a, a call for a physician for sure. Um, the stimulants, you know, they're typically used for ADHD, which is just, it, it has blown up as I'm sure you know, and I'd love getting any feedback on that from anybody if that you're seeing that as well. But um, everything that I have read talks about that the use of ADHD Ritalin was our first drug, and now it's kind of more ADHD, but Ritalin is still out there and is still used. It does have some different chemicals in it, but um, the ADHD is uh, being, it, it's, just, there, it's, being just, it's being diagnosed everywhere. But since COVID, um, the use of Adderall went crazy. Um, COVID did, did a number on everybody in all kinds of ways. So since COVID, um, if you would go to try to get some uh, Adderall, Ritalin, it will be much more difficult, not, not impossible, but they're gonna really make sure that you truly have ADHD. Um, that where before, you know, it was given out, just, oh, you, you got this, you got that, okay, here you go. And now they are testing very carefully. They're being very selective on who they give these medications to. 
you you will go through quite a rigorous exam, most likely, and um, it, it and the physicians who are prescribing it are being monitored very closely now. So it's it's gotten much tighter, and I think that is a very good thing, actually. Okay, next slide. Uh, these are some side effects that, uh, and, and there's, it's not by any means all inclusive, but these are some side effects for psychotropic medications, not limited to, but common to have increased, decreased appetite, tremors. Um, and this is not the big, huge body muscle movement. It is the just little jittery tremors, dry mouth, sexual effects, fatigue, drowsiness, which will increase now your falls risk. So we got to keep that in mind as well. Weight gain, weight loss. It seems to be a bigger problem for children and adolescents. They have more of the weight loss. They pretty much lose their appetite. Um, so that's when you're going to be giving them appetite, you know, um, enhancers and, and trying to get them to get some, some kind of protein and calories in them. Um, where the adults don't have quite the same problem. Um, although we might like the same problem, have a little bit of more weight loss. Um, insomnia and constipation. And again, you guys, that is not all inclusive there. It could be so many more things, but those are some of the kind of the common ones that I think we, we hear often. Okay, next screen. All right, so I'm gonna refer you guys now to the uh, CMS State Operations Manual called the SOM uh, regarding psychotropic medications. I just kind of want you to hit the high points for you uh, as far as regulatory and things to be thinking about in your facilities. Um, you want to be sure that all psychotropic medications, they have to have a specific diagnosed patient-centered uh, diagnosis condition for them, um, and it needs to be documented in the medical record. That reason needs to be in the medical record. Any psychotropic medication, all right? We just can't say to tell the doctor, oh, you know, Susie seems like she's a little bit down. Well, let's just give her some Prozac. They're, they, I, 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 they're going to need more than she's just a little down. So you've got to put something in there. You've got to put what you're seeing, what you're going to do, and why we're given this. Now, psychotropic medications, if they're ordered PRN, um, they have a life of 14 days before that PRN order expires. Now, the physician or the provider can renew that order just needs to uh, put in the medical record that they're renewing it and why they are renewing it, and that will, that will fly just fine. But they can't just order it and not make a note and not talk about why they're, re they're reordering. Um, we're gonna, you're going to want to be sure have in your medical records, probably in your TAR, in your, um, a lot of times people often have to put it in their TAR, the monitoring uh, your residents' behaviors, um, their movements, things, how they're doing on these medications because that is a huge one. Um, when we come in, I don't know how many times I've heard on surveys, where do you monitor your behaviors? And you get this look in people's eyes, they go, what? The, the best I have seen is when they put it in the MAR. And then, I mean, the TAR, sorry, MAR be fine too, but the TAR, Treatment Administration Record. And again, if I say words that you don't know out there, please, please chat and we'll let you know. Um, but that's where I see it, it work the best, only because it's there and they have to fill it out when they do their, when they do their charting. Um, they're also going to want to look at, surveyors will come in, and this is also in the best interest of the resident, that we are doing some kind of um, non-pharmacological interventions. You know, we just don't want to hit everybody with pills. Now, you know, they may need that, and that's fine. That's what medicine is for. But let's do other things, too. And that is, you know, in the psalm that they're looking for what you've done, whether they're on medication or not, you know, if they're not yet, what did you do to try to keep them off of it? Um, did you play music? Did you get them activities? Did you, whatever it is that you might have done to help them stay calm and not depressed, did you get them to activities? You know, anything that you can do that's non-pharmacological would be great. Um, and even if they do go on the medication, that doesn't stop there. We got to keep giving them other things and maybe we can get them off pretty soon. Long-term use of psychotropic, especially antipsychotic, is uh, can lead to some very serious side effects uh, for some, not for all. We never know who and why. But so keep that non-pharmacological going even before they are any kind of uh, psychotropic and even when they are on it, because uh, maybe we can just get them off. 
uh, care plans. Be sure that you have in your care plan that they're on this medication. What are your monitoring actions going to be? What uh, are the side effects everybody needs to be looking for to notify a physician or a provider? Very important. Um, if there's any risk from the, like if there's if there are increased falls risk now because it's going to make them drowsy, whatever the medication is, have a very comprehensive care plan on your psychotropic medications. And finally, we really got to be careful and we need to use these medications appropriately. And what I mean by that is it can't be the for convenience of the staff. Uh, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse a long time. Um, but what we don't want to get hung up on here and get hit with is a chemical restraint. So if they're getting something for sleep, if they're getting something to calm them down at night, then they should be getting it at two in the afternoon because they're, you know, you're not getting your work done. So be careful. Um, and it's a slippery slope, you know, and you'll have people that'll try to say, well, yeah, but they were it just there. There are no rules is your best judgment, but it's all about the intent of the drug, what the intent of the drug and why it was ordered. And is that intent of what was ordered appropriate in this situation right now at one of the afternoon when it's supposed to be at nighttime for sleep. Any questions on that? I know I'm talking a lot. Anything Stephanie, you can think of? Stephanie yeah. you're doing a fantastic job. And I was thinking about what your last statement was on the um, that perception of the chemical restraints and how how that can occur. I remember having a conversation with a surveyor uh, at one point in time for a resident that we had um, who was terminal, um, a lot of aggression, was hitting staff, he was Ooh. biting staff. Yep. Um, and we were identifying that while it wasn't good for us, no. can't be good for him either. <laughs> he, no. That was not a comfortable place to be in. And so we were able to get him on a regimen and he was very sleepy Yep. and peaceful <laughs> and uh -huh. had that conversation with the surveyor like well but he's not crying and he's not biting and and where it's good to be able to take that step back and where your your team and your quality assurance team right. can have that conversation and say so let's assess where we're at we've gone from one extreme to another right. you know and where we can meet in the middle um, the surveyor was kind enough to help us facilitate that conversation. And it wasn't too bad of a citation, um, but it was what a good learning opportunity that we had to to really reassess what our program was and how our team was looking at documentation. Right. Did they did they tag for chemical restraint? Um, nope. We were okay. tagged okay. for unnecessary medications. Okay. Because he was we were giving it because he was so laid out and not do yes exactly. And yep. we've got to be, you know, and that's kind of, I recommend that's on your mar and taller too. I mean, all these things, the, the, the behaviors, the affect, you know, um, the meals, is he, is he or she eating or just sleeping through other meals now? So now we've gone way too yeah. far. So, and in the beginning, it's hard. You're, you, you're playing a game, but that's where our monitoring and our assessment, that's your nursing assessments. It's your nurse aid monitoring as well as your nurses. It's, it's, it's everybody. It's your and, social worker who might know the patient very well that he's always in her office every morning. And now since these new meds, she never sees him anymore. Yeah. And there can be slight changes that you don't yeah. pick up on yeah. when you stop back and look at it that, wow, over six, seven weeks, this is where we're at. But every incremental little piece of the moment, like, wow, he's not biting someone. He's not yelling. He's feeling more comfortable. So I, I see what yeah. you're saying that it, um, it just really reinforces our opportunity to ensure that our systems are in place to be able to give that yeah. high level overview as a double check. Yes, ma'am, exactly. Anybody else, any thoughts on that? Or, and, and is everybody understanding of the PRN order rule of the 14 days and they can, um, it can be reordered? It's fine that we have to have a physician reorder, a provider, I keep saying that, I'm sorry, a provider reorder. Are y'all good with that? I think so. Okay. I think we're, you're doing fantastic. Well, thank you. All right. Yeah. Next slide. Stephanie, I do okay. have a question. Yes. Um, with regards to the reorder, uh -huh. is there a, a limitation as to the, the number that it can be, the number of times that it can be reordered before it's viewed as, for example, chemical restraint? I gotcha. There is no rule on how often it needs to be reordered. 
However, there is a rule that when they do reorder, they need to document again why they're reordering and what they expect the duration to be. Are they thinking three months? Are they thinking forever? Well, if it's going to be forever, then you might as well make it a scheduled met. Um, but yes, um, and with the chemical restraints, and that's then that's going to go with if we got a PR in order that Mr. Billy Bob is passed out every day now. We got we got to stop that. Um, so there's they can order it and reorder, and if it's going well, that's great. If it's working and they get it two or three times a day, and the PR in order is working, wonderful. He doesn't need it to be scheduled. Um, so and but you know we just got to be very careful that we're not giving it more than we need to as PRN. And I am not dissing the nurses for doing that. I mean, because you're thinking, well, they're calm and they're resting. I, I'm so happy he was up all night long or she, she was just, but you got to remember, what is the intent of the medication? Everything's about intent. It seems like in the world of regulatory, the intent of the medication and the intent of why you're actually giving it right now. And if you can speak to it, you're okay. Thank Great you questions, so you guys. Yeah. And thank you. And there it's, I don't know that there's too often that we see them crossing over into chemical restraints citations. I think, you know, for the most part, uh, as an industry, we see we've got a challenging, complex um, patient population. Yeah. But it's also, I, I think back to your slide, Stephanie, that you had shared about all of the the risks of these medications oh, yeah, that people gonna... have. And that you know, even listening to some of the TV commercials, which I think I might be spoiling right into the GDRs, but the TV commercials where you're like, this is, you know, if you're having problems with sleep at night, you can take this med, but you also may lose your toes or you may, you're like, whoa, wait a second. This is it's this scary. extreme. <laughs> and that's where we got to pray and pray that our providers that are, that are, you know, prescribing these medications are paying attention to what they're already on you know, what you're giving them and that we are so closely monitoring them. And I'm going to tell you a little story in a second about that very thing. But yeah, it's, it's, they, polypharmacy is alive and well, especially in our nursing facilities, without a doubt. It's, it's something. So yeah, so okay, well, if we're going to be on these psychotropics, um, there are, there are regulations strongly watched and, and monitored regulations around gradual dose reduction, aka GDR. Um, and so what the expectation is, is that uh, once you have these residents on, and this is well, this will go more towards antipsychs, but this is also with uh, uh, psychotropics, but that we need to do G GDRs um, at certain intervals to see if the symptoms are changing. Can it, is it getting worse? Do we need to up it? Is it that they're just passed out and we need to lower it? Um, and if they're doing well, can we just try to slowly even bring it down a little more and see where we can go, how low we can go? What, we can get a little limbo. How low can we go? So how low can we go? Um, or can it even eventually be discontinued? Uh, so, but, but these have to be done. And I want to tell everybody out there, if you are in any point where you would be part of managing the, the uh, EMR or form, physician forms, provider forms, be sure that you keep these signed the, the provider signed GDRs in the medical record are very readily available. I would encourage you to scan them into your medical record. Um, we many times would see the GDRs that the pharmacy sent, but there was no there was no signature from a provider, and there were no actions. So that, that so therefore we saw that they fell through the crack. So you got to be sure these physicians, uh, these providers. I'm so sorry. See these GDRs, get them signed, and now they don't have to do this. They don't have to do a gradual dose reduction. They can say, absolutely not. It is contraindicated for my patient. That would be dangerous. And all they have to do is write that on that form. And it'll go back to the pharmacy. You know, you'll keep a copy, go to the pharmacy, and it's done. So we're not telling anyone how to prescribe. Just we're keeping them alert. And that's your pharmacy working for you there. So you want to be sure that your pharmacy is on top of their game and monitoring the meds and monitoring your carts and doing all the things it's supposed to do. Their MMRs monthly. But this is something that they should be looking at. And it's not even just for for for, uh, for psychotropics or anti -psych. It's for all kinds of medications. Um, I remember one time I was, there was a resident that, uh, that was getting five different eye drops. Five different throughout the, I mean, it was just the one, every different doctor had ordered all these eye drops. And it was all for the same thing. But it was, but, well, a little bit different, I should say. But no one knew it was just basically five times more than she needed or four times more than she needed. So things like that, where sometimes 
things fall through the crack. Um, the uh, the question always is, um, how how often do you have to do GDR? And my answer to you is this: it's not a great answer. Um, it is not set in stone. They say um, adequate monitoring and uh, frequent GDRs, or they'll use the word frequent, or they'll, they'll use um, intermittent GDRs, um, which leaves you kind of like, I, I don't know. Well, but, but, but before I get to that, I'm going to show you something in a minute, but I'm sorry, I just kind of jumped for a second. Um, also, I meant to tell you guys, also, when, if, and when we do get to taper, gradually taper these drugs um, from our residents, this has also got to be huge. Um, get your documentation in there of the observed behaviors and effectiveness of the taking the medication down or away. Make sure we have good, good documentation. Okay. Also, you should see this stuff on your care plan as far as your uh, antipsychotics, psychotropic meds. Um, these should you should have care plans for all these things, and this all should be documented on your MDS, on your medications, uh, anything on your. Um, and section M is your medications. Section D is your mood with your uh, PHQ-9. And then you'll have uh, your behaviors, uh, section E. So um, be sure you kind of scan your MDSs and be sure you're hitting all the appropriate places. Not only for, you know, we need, we need good and clear documentation. But it's also going to be part of your billing, part of the services received, all that kind of stuff. All right, next slide. So now here's the best I can give you guys as far as any kind of, and it's not a rule, but any kind of guidance um, for when to do a gradual dose reduction. And I literally copied and pasted this straight out of F757 um, in some of the consultative notes. And here it says, See, here's your modest increments over adequate time. Doesn't that make you crazy? I mean, when you're if you're an OCD person like me, or I like things to be just like this, so I meet every single reg, this gets really hard. Um, these vague, you know, words. So, but it says, and we can take it from here, dose reductions should occur in modest increments over adequate periods of time to minimize withdrawal symptoms and to monitor symptom reoccurrence. Beautiful. Okay, here you go. This is what I would personally go with because they say if you do this, you're in compliance. But they're giving you an example, but this example puts you in compliance. So compliance with the, with the requirement to perform a GDR may be met if, for example, within the first year in which a resident is admitted on a psychotropic medication or after they are prescribed one, a uh, facility attempts a GDR in two separate quarters in a year, within a year time, and you have to have at least one month in between of your attempts unless contraindicated. So that is as close as you're going to come to seeing anything that's given you guidance of when to do your GDR. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Um, I will tell you one little cool story. No, it is not a cool story, actually. Well, Stephanie, I'm so sorry. We ha we're running out of time. Do we want to, uh, and I think the aims is really important. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me just say this one thing. Yeah. The, well, we're getting, okay. Go ahead and go to the aims because this is about the aims as well. Oh, any psychotic use. Okay. Also known as neuro, neuroleptics, and they used to be called tranquilizers back in the day. Uh, this is more for psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar, you know, serious dementia, Tourette's. Um, you know, we had our first generation of antipsychotic drugs that were first introduced in the 1950s. And many of them are still being used, and they're called typical antipsychotics. We had a second generation in 1970s. They're called atypical, um, and they're, they're they do the same thing, but they have they say they have less serious side effects, but they still do have serious side effects. Let's not you know think that they don't. And again, mainly dopamine and serotonin uh, issues. Next slide. Uh, here's just some commonly used meds with the black box warnings, Seroquel, big one, uh, Risperdal, Ingreza, Abilify, and so there's your anti-psych, but I also want to mention to you here, anti-emetics, nausea medications. Um, Reglan is, is a, a risk for all these same things, and uh, I can't even say this word, I can't even say this word, uh, Prochlorosa, <laughs> 
So chlorothorazine, I don't know, it used to be compazine. Um, and that's, if you're a little bit older, you used compazine many, many years ago, but it's still out there. It's the still dr same drug, it's just under different names, which this, what this name is. Okay, next slide. All right, possible side effects from anti-sites. You've got dysphoria, you got apathy, that's from the dopamine block. We got sedation, dizziness, um, we got EPS, uh, tardive dyskinesia. And this is going to be, this is the type of EPS that is because of too much dopamine in the brain. So the brain, that your neurotransmitters are saturated and they can't do their job and therefore they can't control the muscle movements. And then we go to something to, we go into abnormal involuntary muscle, uh, our movement scale called AIMS. Oh, I just see something. We cannot code antipsychotics proper diagnosis on MDS for bipolar. So, this is again. Can I see that um, chat again? It's um, Tammy was suggesting to be mindful about the coding on the MDS and that yeah. for the diagnosis for the use of antipsychotics, we cannot have um, M, uh, bipolar or paranoia as a a diagnosis for antipsychotic use. Only schizo uh, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder Tourette's and Huntington's Korea would align with an antipsychotic. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Tammy, have you, have, you, have you felt the differences since uh, CMS came out about the schizophrenic diagnosis? Did you guys have any kind of uh, issues with that? Maybe you'll chat on that, but I'll keep moving. Let's see. Uh, but I'll show that. I'm going to show you the um, uh, that memo in a minute. Okay, so let's get going really quickly to tardive dyskinesia, which is a very uh, serious side effect that's pretty much lifelong that comes from these antipsychotics. Okay, next. And some nausea medications as well. So TD, uh, the name, tardive, means late delay, dyskinesia, involuntary movement. Uh, TD is involuntary repetition repetitive movements involving the mouth, tongue, face, trunk, and extremities. Typically, it's the bottom third of the face. Um, typically, you're going to see a lot of mouth movement, chewing activity, uh, lip smacking. Um, I think what else here we see? Um, um, oh, eyes. Eyes are big. Uh, that's a really easy way to first maybe notice it, is that, that rapid blinking. If everybody is, if you see them blinking, you know, and it's much faster than you're blinking, that's a sign typically of, a, of extra ser uh, extra dopamine in their brain. So watch those eyes. Swallowing can be a sign that you see. It's pretty easy to catch. Um, it is said around, uh, I've seen different studies everywhere, so I'm going to give a ballpark figure. 600,000 adults have TD in the United States, which puts it at one in five adults with mental illness uh, is on an anti-psych and has TD. Big numbers. Then it's going to get bigger and bigger because they're they're coming out with more and more. And I don't see this. You know, I don't. I know that we're trying to control it more, but it's still heavily used. Um, some patients might develop it while they're on it, but it's not so much likely. And maybe as early as a month later, it could be five, ten years later, even when they're off the medication. So just a quick thought there: when you have somebody come in and a new admission and you get their drugs, what they're on. Ask them, were you ever on these other medications? Because we still need to be watching them and be cognizant that they may start showing signs of TD. Because, um, it, uh, like I said, it could be two years, five years. They take up to 10 years later. And they don't even know what it is because they're not thinking about those medications anymore. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's crazy. So be sure that you're assessing how far back and did they ever take these psychotropics. And, and there is no cure. There's a, these are drugs called VMAT2 inhibitors. I'm not going to go into what they all are, but they help keep serotonin, a little typo there, and dopamine uh, levels higher in the brain. Uh, or, I'm sorry, higher. <laughs> they help to keep these levels at a better level, um, the serotonin and the dopamine. Um, again, not a cure, but they try to keep them under control. And, you know, this can just be devastating to life. I mean, I don't need to tell you all that. You've all seen people with TD. I was going to show you a video, but I'm not. Uh, but it is a, even mild is very serious, very, very uh, damaging. Okay, next slide. All right, this is what the AIMS tool looks like. Now, this, if you don't have an AIMS tool, which I'm pretty sure you do, uh, I would think you would. But if you don't, it's okay. All right, we have it. There's one we can get today. 
um, th these are the same tools and they're on the internet everywhere. And they say for free or use, take them. Um, and you can, I won't go into detail what all they're going to be showing you, but they're going to be testing and just looking at facial and oral movements, extremity movements, trunk movements, global judgments. Like the big question for them is, are you aware of this, that this is happening? If you're aware, is it distressing to you? Is it upsetting to you? And that's a, that's a big part right there. Um, we check their dental status to be sure that they don't, maybe don't have loose dentures or teeth problems that we're, we're confusing, you know, with uh, these mouth movements, but a lot of tongue thrusting. So, but um, again, what I want to keep saying to you on this stuff, this takes training and, you know, a clinical person can do it. It could be your PT, it could be your PT assistant, it could be a nurse. I don't know that I would have a nurse aide, um, but it's, there's so many educational sites, even with CEUs. I just, I did a couple of them the other day. And they're really good. So um, please, um, if you don't think, you know, your staff is maybe the best at it, have your educator or yourself, whoever is in charge in your facility to do something like that, have them go on these um, online sources and uh, you watch the videos, you take a test, you've got to figure it out. And it's, they're very, very good. And they're pretty much all clinician driven and, and made. Um, okay. And this is kind of you get another scale um, where this number of items for the different scale. And um, basically, a, uh, a score, um, I'm trying to think what the score was. Uh, you, want, you would like to have a zero score, obviously. Um, and I just want to think I had that somewhere. <laughs> I, I think a score of anywhere from two, one to two to three or four. Um, is a positive, positive TD assessment. Um, and remember, though, this this form is not to diagnose. It's a clinical tool to assess. Okay. So not diagnostic. Okay. Any questions, you guys? I know I, I just talk and I talk and I talk. Any questions? Tammy was commenting um, to answer your question, Stephanie, about the diagnosis with the use of the antipsychotics, and she was commenting that um, that they're aware of how they've been using and coding appropriately, and that physicians are using what the FDA has uh -huh. approved for medications. Okay. Um, and so there's a little bit of a disconnect that they're working through, since the regs are given this one direction, and FDA kind of gives some other. So yeah, good insight. I wish we had the um, memo. I don't know where it went. Well, let's keep rolling anyway, through. Yeah. So, um, yes, that's let's... great. That is great news that you guys are on top of it. it, it everything is always vague, isn't it? The only final thing I just want to say so fast is that there was a we had a situation where we had a resident who had been on anti psychs for four years, never had an AIMS done, mm -hmm. developed TD. By the time the family they were out of town, the time they figured it out, it was pretty severe. Um, they were very angry. Da -da 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 -da. And they they had a lawyer, and they wanted to know all about you know how we monitored them, and there was not even a single aims done. Um, that did not hold, bode well for us, and there were several tags that followed that. That this also went to court, and that aims test is held up as the standard of care, and this is what you do when you have patients on neuroleptics. You have to be paying attention. So just FYI on that. Thank you, and I think um, well. Just quickly, um, just to kind of wrap through this uh, and get into a discussion period, because I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, the information that we've shared just kind of brings it back into the quality assurance process. Um, so yeah. if we're looking at um, our audits, we're looking at our diagnosis, we're looking at our coding, um, we're taking a quick peek on what does that high-level overview look like and what that impact is on the quality assurance and quality outcomes for uh, our organization, bring that through the QAPI process, we can really get a good <clears throat> insight on how the work is going. Sometimes as, as um, some tips and, and tricks that we've seen over time, <clears throat> if you build it into your quality assurance committee process to use the survey pathway on behavioral expressions or the unnecessary medication tools. Uh, those are available from CMS. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you use those, and let's say quarterly, you spot check some items, maybe you have another member of your team that's not on your behavioral committee, um, 
to have them take a peek and doing that audit and see what they are experiencing, what the documentation looks like. It creates that um, the outside perspective in the documentation where we may know what's happening with someone and we may be close to the situation, having another peer that's in there, maybe our director of rehab does a couple quick audits for us uh, and documents it on that survey pathway. Now we're able to say, do we have an opportunity here for education, documentation? Um, it's about the not about a gotcha moment. It's about saying this is where our opportunity to grow is. And when you're having complex issues, that's where we have the best opportunity to, to bring it into quality assurance. Um, the CMS, uh, CMS released the uh, memos uh, 2305, QSO 2305 last January, I believe, 2023. Um, it's about the use of antipsychotics in nursing homes. The basis on this is that we've been coding MDS for several decades now. We've been coding diagnosis, we've been coding medications. And so there's lots of information out there. And we know as an, a nation what the rate of schizophrenia is across the country. And so the increasing numbers of people that are being diagnosed with schizophrenia that are aligning with these antipsychotic use in the facilities triggered an opportunity to take a look at the audits. So for an organization, take a look at your MDSs, um, see what you're coding in, uh, how many people you have coded as having schizophrenia, um, looking in those charts and ensuring that you have diagnosis. If there's anything that's new diagnosis of schizophrenia within the last six months, you're going to want to talk to the person's primary care office or um, community mental health organizations prior to them coming in to determine if that diagnosis was there or their symptoms were there. Um, yeah prior to their admission to be able to to cover that. Um, that's going to be really important because that's where that flag is coming from. So schizophrenic audits is really big. We'll send some information out with the slides on that um, and happy to help if you have any questions around yeah, that. Absolutely. So before we close out, we've got one minute remaining. Um, <laughs> Olivia, if you want to take the slides down, does anybody have any questions or, or final thoughts before we close today's session? It's been a fantastic discussion. Thank you for your engagement and the conversation. Uh, hope to continue those going forward. Uh, the slides will be available. Yeah. The YouTube channel will be updated. And just as a small promo, uh, we will be back next month on June 20th at 11 a.m. So looking forward to having you join us at that time as well. And I do want to thank Tammy for, speak, for sending in some chats. That was wonderful. We all learn that way. That's how we learn what other people are doing. Great job. Great. Okay, uh, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. And it is 12 o'clock. Have a fantastic afternoon and we'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.